And it is the Thursday, May 11th, 2017, regular board meeting, SBCC City College. Um, our roll call is all present uh, among the trustees except Veronica Gallardo, who is unable to join us today. And our student trustee will be joining us, I believe, next month. Is that correct? Yeah. Our new student trustee. Um, welcome. We have a relatively small audience today, but important folks that we are always happy to see. <laughs> and I think we do not have any special recognitions today, correct, no, Anthony? not this time. Okay. So that takes us to public comment, and I have a slip from Cornelia Alshimer. Honorable members of the Board of Trustees, President Croninger, Dr. Beebe, I just wanted to report back from the annual spring party which the Faculty Association hosted last Saturday. So every year we honor our faculty retirees at this event, and so we did last week. However, this party this time around was anything but usual. We had a record number of retirees, we had a record number of guests overall, we had a record number of speeches, and we had record low temperatures and record <laughs> high winds. <laughs> um, but as every year, it was a very fun event, and for those of you who did not make it, I have here a small brochure that we made, with, which has all our retirees with a little write-up and a picture. This is the first mm -hmm. time we did that, and I yeah. hope you will enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelia. Mm -hmm. Sounds like quite a lot of records there. <laughs> I wonder if they were outside at the Welby's. In were, the you, were you outside? <laughs> yes, we were. Outside. We were. Back porch of, uh -huh. uh, of Laura yeah. Welby's, yeah. 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 I was going to attend and my, bring my wife and. Uh, my wife said, I'm not going to the Welby's backyard <laughs> in this weather. <laughs> so I didn't make it. It was very lovely. Yeah. Very nice. All right, that takes us to the minutes, and I think we can take them together. We have minutes for February 10th and April 13th, 2017. May I have a motion to approve? Peter, Craig second. <coughs> Any comments, corrections? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes are passed. The academic calendar is next. Did you want to give us any comments on that, Anthony? Uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. If you'd like, uh, I have Dr. Jarrell here that can talk about it in more detail if you'd like. Um, let's do a motion first and then we'll see if anyone has questions. Can I have a motion to approve? Mary Ann, second. Come on, guys, wake up. <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> okay. Now, anybody have questions? Well, we were uh, just given this wonderful brochure. And, uh, we were focused lost in the brochure, I know. Every teacher yeah. knows not to distribute this stuff when you're trying to accomplish something else. <laughs> you're not good at multitasking. No. <laughs> no one is. Okay. I have a question. Jonathan. So is our calendar essentially set by the system like UC's is? What do you mean by the system? Like the <laughs> no. community college system? Because at UC, they, like, the campus has no choice. Like, they make a calendar, but it's based on what the UC system has decided. So. No, it, ours is locally developed. Okay. Paul can talk to you. We've spent a lot of time going through and developing this calendar, <laughs> so it's, it's a lot of work. The, the only thing that is, is set for us by the state are the holidays. Okay. And then we arrange a calendar around the holidays, depending upon uh, uh, whether we're on some some districts are even on quarters, but we're on semesters. And then whether or not we have a winter intercession, and then two primary terms in the summer, or a longer summer. That's a local decision. And then we we uh, uh, build um, uh, the calendar start dates around that. So the the state or the system gives us our holidays could we add more or no we have to have 175 instructional days so we okay. just have to get our instructional okay. days in that makes sense thank you you're welcome i think that it's tight 
is what happens when you add the holidays plus the two summer terms and so forth. We, we tried very hard to get uh, a third, uh, 53rd week into this past year. <laughs> <laughs> really hard. It just didn't work. Um, and it uh, didn't, didn't work. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that it's coming, typically you would get this in October. Uh, I think the policy the, the reads by November or something like that. But uh, the reason we brought it forward so early, this is for not next year, but the following year even, right. uh, was to be able to move up our scheduled development so that we can develop a schedule a year in advance so a student will be able to see a year schedule in advance. To do that, we had to know what the academic calendar was. So that's what drove the moving up the timeline. Well, thank you, Paul. That's really helpful information. Um, Greg? Go ahead. Okay. okay. I I was curious about why was was the motive to get this out a year ahead of time just simply well not just simply but for the stu sake of the students being able to yeah plan absolutely. what was going on yeah planning so this is part of we have you know a couple projects going on that we're trying to make it easier for students to be able to plan and track uh, one of them was to be able to see what courses were being offered uh, the other thing that that allows us to do is to really ensure that we're offering courses in a manner in a sequence that makes sense for students to be able to complete so we're working on uh, a full-time uh, attendance plan that would allow students to complete in a cycle you know a, a part-time plan or whatever so part all of that all of this is about trying to make that pathway for students to be able to complete something a little bit more transparent I guess Marty your turn yeah, I just um, we looked at the calendar a couple years ago and we said oh it looks great and everything and then it turns out it really didn't look great because there was some days that were I've forgotten what exactly well, I think there was a desire for a holiday before on the 24th yeah, yeah, or something like that but anyway I you know I look at this and it looks good the one thing that I really like about it is you've got a week between um, the end of uh, or I guess between commencement and the beginning of summer school and that didn't happen a couple years ago either yeah we tried so, that was what motivated the this latest round yeah. of calendar development was to try to be able to provide a little bit of downtime to allow for routine work to, that has to happen right. on campus happen uh, when students aren't present. And so, it just makes a lot of sense. So I, I yeah. appreciate it, and I think everything's fine. Now watch something. You know, well, we looked at it several it's, times. I know, I mean, but know, sometimes you never know. <laughs> it just helps to look at it again. But you know, I, I think it looks really good. So thank yeah. you for those weeks here yeah, and there. Sure. That's good. Appreciate you picking up on that. Yeah. Because that's yes. where it gets tough, is yeah. trying to figure out how to Well, do how that. can you, you know, f have commencement on a Friday and Monday summer school starts? It's just yeah. crazy making for everybody, yeah. you know. Greg. Yeah, not to beat this into the ground, but every time I see changes, like I see changes, <clears throat> my mind starts going, <clears throat> what was what were the reasons why they didn't do that before you don't want to why go they there. only did it year to year. <laughs> and i probably don't want to know why but but i but that's the kind of way I, that always raises that question in my mind is why and and do most of our uh, sister institutions have like two years out on their calendars uh no actually they don't i mean this is a typical process to be developing uh just a year in advance uh, we're required to submit a, the calendar to, this, to the chancellor's office, but that's so late in the game. We just need, and that's what drove the having to, to be approved by the board by November was that. Um, but this is really looking more from a student-centric point of view. I will say that that there are many districts that are moving toward, more towards those long-term calendaring where they might develop, and we tried to do that this time around, a two years in advance, and um, we have a calendar. Uh, it's a mirror of that one, but we didn't want to bring that and get locked in until we had a chance to live with this one for a while uh, for, for 1920, for 2019, 2020. So we're moving towards that longer range planning. But most institutions are just a year out. Okay. I, can, I would like to say um, thank you to Dr. Jarrell, to Priscilla Butler, the Academic Senate, CPC, we spent lot, hours and hours a lot of great conversations, talking about this surveys. kind of thing. So, I mean, this is, it, you know, here it is all summarized, nice and neat and everything, but this is a lot of work, hours and hours of discussion. So to answer Jonathan's original question, it's very local. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Very local. Uh, okay. Uh, Peter, you have a question. One, one way of solving part of the problem that you've identified is to to not schedule a, a holiday during the work week if that holiday happens to fall on a Saturday or a Sunday, mm -hmm. such as Veterans Day right. this next year falls on a Sunday. 
So why? Why, why schedule it during the, the yeah. work week? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. I think sometimes it depends on it. if it's one the state might have given, might actually tell us Veterans Day has to be during the week. I'm not sure about that particular one. No? I don't think it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's a, I it's think a you bring up a good decision point. to have a holiday. It is, and, correct. And perhaps, you know, perhaps we should say that that's the reason it is. Yeah. Um, but if you if if the problem that you're identifying I think properly is one of scheduling then that might be a consideration for next year yeah I, mm -hmm. I cert yeah I mean the the if a holiday falls on a weekend we, we're not not mandated a three-day weekend yeah. Liz says I am our bargaining <laughs> our bargaining <laughs> agreements may have it <laughs> I, I don't know I'm not you get you get the Monday <clears throat> yeah yeah. See, this is what happens. <laughs> Are you asking me Liz keeps us straight. <laughs> Cornelia keeps us straight. Liz keeps us straight. That's why they come to these meetings to <laughs> make sure we uh, remember all those things. Any other questions? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, now we come to our report of sabbatical outcomes, and um, this is Marit, is that? Would you pronounce your beautiful name for us? So we don't, we were going to try to take a shot at it, but we thought we'd mess it up, but would you pronounce it? I you were going to try and sing it. No, I, d I tried, I decided not to. It's a lot to. easier to sing it. Uh, Marit Termata Martinson. Beautiful. So, uh, yeah, so that's uh, my name. And just a few things, since we don't all know each other. So um, I've been an ESL teacher for 20 years, 12, um, 12 years here at Santa Barbara City College. And uh, I've been a teacher trainer for about 17 years. And so I love working with teachers from around the globe. Um, I'm a former ESL student myself. Um, I come from the Netherlands, and so English was actually my fourth language that we had to study in high school. And, uh, and I, I'm only pointing this out over here. Normally, I wouldn't talk about my family here, but everyone in my family is a teacher, literally everyone. I mean, going back to uncles, brother, you know, it goes very far back. And, uh, and I, the reason I point that out, because I think teachers are rock stars, but really the reason I'm pointing that out is because the first day of every class, I always ask my students, how many teachers are there? And they're always, they always say one teacher. And I say, no, no, look around you. There are at least 30 of you. And so it's really about the students being the rock stars to me. And that's what this whole presentation and my sabbatical was about. It's all about the students. So. Uh, just a word of gratitude uh, for making it possible for me to um, to have a sabbatical leave. This was really kind of a dream project, and uh, and it was kind of amazing with how much enthusiasm it was um, um, welcomed right away. Um, and so thank you to the board, president, vice president, to Senate, um, sabbat the sabbatical committee, the ESL department uh, for supporting me in this journey. And uh, so even though it was really an opportunity for professional development for myself, um, this project was not about me. Obviously, it was about the bigger picture. It was really about bringing every single ESL teacher on board. And um, so I'll talk a little more about that soon, but it's really about bringing every single non-credit and credit ESL teacher on board. Um, so I have a quote here that I want to read. Self-awareness and self-observation are the cornerstones of all professional development. And uh, if you look at the first name, it's uh, Kathleen Bailey. She is kind of like the, the, the god in ESL on professional development. And she was writing this book just as I was finishing up my graduate studies. And I was in her class. And so she was experimenting all these activities for a book with our, with our class at the Monterey Institute of International Studies. And uh, those words always resonated with me, and it was really a big part of my project. So a little bit of background. So of course, the college, there was the One College Initiative. And uh, so for ESL, that meant a lot of changes, because you know, we're a pretty you know, sizable program. 
And uh, all of a sudden, we had twice the size, you know, students, teachers. And so when I uh, became ESL chair in 2014, I all of a sudden, you know, I was working with 58 ESL teachers. And, you know, these were not just teachers here on the main campus, also at Wakeshot, I mean, there were 15 locations total. And uh, so it was a fun challenge, but I really liked that because I actually worked with a lot of those teachers before um, with local conferences for ESL teachers as well. Um, but what really stood out that year was that, you know, I was charged with right away evaluating 12 non-credit ESL teachers. And uh, so as I was starting my observations, and I've been doing that, <laughs> you know, I love working with teachers. And uh, as I was doing these observations, I kept thinking, wow, we really need discipline-specific professional development for our teachers. We've talked a lot about it in you know, credit ESL. In non-credit ESL, there's nothing like that. And, uh, and so the coordinator at the time, uh, Lisa Gardner-Flores and I, we were talking about it. You know, what are some ways that we could go about it? And so that's really when my uh, sabbatical, when I wrote it, I was like, I think this is the timing. And so I was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so um, I really wanted the discipline specific um, PD of professional development. Um, and really it's, you know, all with an eye on, you know, providing the best kind of teaching in the classroom. So, these are the three phases of my sabbatical. So uh, a big chunk of my sabbatical was doing primary, secondary research. Then um, I had a lot of data, so it was analyzing that, sharing data, and then um, I abbreviated professional development to PD, um, setting up a PD framework, outcomes, and then also the future, of course, because I really wanted something sustainable. So I um, started, I don't think, is there a pointer here with this one? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I don't see it. Anyway, um, of course it's very cyclical, but um, so I started with a literature review where it was very exciting that, you know, I got to examine all this research since 2001 when I finished my grad studies uh, from all the leading voices on professional development in the ESL field. Um, and then I also contacted about over 30 ESL leaders at other community colleges um, all through California, and then also teachers in other countries, uh, because I really wanted to get their perspective on professional development as well. And, um, and then I, I created very comprehensive surveys for all our faculty in credit and non-credit, and conducted those uh, with a 100% res uh, response rate. So, you know, it was paper, it was Google Forms, I went to the in-services. I'm like, I want to make sure that everyone has a voice in this project. And then I also interviewed all the full-time faculty, um, the coordinator, the chair, um, right away also with an eye on funding. Because when there's professional development, you really want to make sure that you know, people are motivated to participate, especially in non-credit. So the fun part began, of course, with analyzing all that data. And uh, so here are just some of the themes and topics that emerged. And if you want to read more about it, there's about 128 pages of it, so you can help yourself. But I'll just project it over here. Uh, but there are a lot of similar themes that emerged, but also some that were very specific to credit and some very specific to non-credit. So um, I wanted to make sure that you know everyone was involved in this project. And so I shared you know, the charts and the results with you know, the chair, the coordinator at non-credit as well, a dean, um, I created a prezi for an ESL department meeting, I attended two um, credit um, adjunct faculty member, or, uh, faculty in services, um, created two different presentations for that, and then also in non-credit, I created a PowerPoint for, for all the non-credit uh, teachers over there. And uh, we started a PD committee, and so that's what you know, my, my sabbatical led to the formation of a professional development committee um, that is housed at the Wake Center, but it's really for everyone. And, uh, and actually the, the PD meeting, I mean, or the PD committee, I mean, it is, I had this vision for my project and I knew it was gonna be really big. 
and then it's become a movement, really. I mean, it's kind of amazing. Everyone's talking about professional development, and there's so much excitement with it. It's, it's really kind of amazing how, um, how things have evolved. So we launched a, a mentoring program on um, technology assistant language learning. We call that TEL in the ESL field. And uh, so we piloted that in, uh, in non-credit. We're piloting coaching in the credit program. Uh, we have a really robust PD calendar. Um, and it was all about sustainability. So we have you know, a checklist for every workshop to make sure that everything is taken care of. Um, and uh, we've already had seven workshops, but then we started working with the curriculum committee as well, and so it's been many more events um, in addition to that. Um, also, I mean, it's just, you know, it's just strengthened our bridge with non-credit so much. And uh, since, you know, it's always been with an eye on further integration. And, uh, and so, um, my project, my sabbatical, also led to um, a basic skills transformation, a BST uh, grant, and so I'm on a three-year grant right now within Credit ESL, uh, really working on, you know, um, find, creating pathways from non-credit to credit, and uh, so it's a three-year project, so this is our first year, and I was able to continue um, in terms of professional development, especially. And uh, also, we've been working together on SLOs, uh, we just got a project approved to do take on writing with rubrics uh, and teaching and um, feedback strategies um, again for credit and non-credit teachers so that we're all working together um, so the wheels are turning it's pretty exciting and uh, so we've been making great strides at collaborating I think and integrating um, credit non-credit I mean we're certainly not there yet but I feel like we've learned so much uh, over the past two years and there's so much goodwill and you know we just collaborate so much and I'm there just about every two weeks and uh, and then if we have other events I'm there more often than that as well and uh, it's yeah it's been really exciting so there's been a lot of collaboration a lot of community building, um, reflective teaching, it, it's, you know, people are talking about it and that's really what it's about. Uh, so a lot of growth and really, again, with that eye on integration. So I wanted to bring my uh, sabbatical project back to what I think is the heart of the project. It's all about student success, of course. And uh, so actually I just added some pictures from this morning from a presentation as well. And uh, so I chose to add some of these pictures over here because one of the non-credit teachers and I were uh, getting ready for a project-based learning uh, workshop in the fall to really bring project-based learning to non-credit as well uh, as another effective uh, teaching strategy really to foster student success. So um, thank you to everyone, of course. And uh, I wanted to read one quote from a non-credit teacher because of course we have an evaluation form for everything we do within uh, professional development. And so this is what she wrote after we had a technology workshop. And she said, you made me feel like, yes, I can be a 21st century teacher. Loved it, many thanks. And uh, so it's, it's kind of exciting that people are talking about professional development and wanting to be involved. and. And, uh, and they're talking about what works best with students and what about the latest you know, literature on it. So it's been uh, really exciting. So here's just a little bibliography. And uh, I think that's about it. But wow. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No, it's good. Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, this is a really cool presentation. My question is, what's your ideal integration of credit and non-credit ESL? Like, how do you see that? You know, it's, it's interesting that you asked that because I don't have the answer for you yet because we just, the uh, first year of the basic skills transformation grant was information gathering. So we've been meeting very regularly with non-credit as well. And, um, and actually we just figured out a way to pay non-credit teachers to attend department meetings as well because we're like, everyone needs to be there, right? Everyone should have a voice. Um, so we're really at the, the information gathering stage. The second year of the, the BST grant, so the Basic Transformational Grant, 
is about analyzing all this data. And then the third year is about piloting and really creating <coughs> a whole framework. So we're not quite there yet, yeah. but, um, but there are definitely you know, some thoughts about it. I mean, I, th I think, um, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to have two totally separate programs. And also for students, it's, it's really great if they can, you know, if they're stacked classes, for example, as well, where, you know, they can take, for example, a credit class, but it can be credit or non-credit, <coughs> right? Mm. Um, but also where you take, um, you take classes, for example, in the credit program, but you take some vessel classes in non-credit as well. Um, so I would like to, for the lines not to be so clear, but to be much grayer. Mm. Um, I mean, I think for the students, that it doesn't mean anything to them, yeah. right? Yeah. But I think as professional, uh, professionals, um, I think we each have our strengths. And we, you know, of course, the credit program is a very academic preparation program. So that's really what you need in preparation to take courses on campus, of course. But it's really about building those bridges. And so we want to be very, you know, we, we really, with a lot of intention, want to have those bridges and really clear pathways. Because right now it's so big mm. <laughs> and it should be really clear because it's, it's confusing to us, you know, when we started this project. And then what about the students? If it's confusing to us, mm -hmm. it should be really transparent to everyone, right? So, um, so I think, you know, the next two years, I think those are the, the really big years. But I feel like the last two years, it's been so much about building that community and goodwill and, and really that collaborative atmosphere and where we're talking about pedagogy. Uh, because in non-credit, there were just not these opportunities. And now uh, I keep being linked into the, um, the AEBG grant. It's uh, the block grant in non-credit. And so each time, of course, I make sure that professional development is part of that so we can keep that dialogue going with everyone. Um, but yeah, kind of this, I mean, the sky's the limit right now, right? But uh, we want to visit some colleges this next year as well and some other programs to see what they're doing, particularly the Mon uh, Monterey Peninsula College, MPC. They do a lot with stack classes. Um, but this is new. I mean, this is not just new in general, right? It's still in California. It's like all the programs, we're trying, trying to figure it out. Yeah. It's just that it's great that, you know, the college supported us in taking on the basic st skills transformation grant so we can dedicate, uh, you know, a big portion of our time on that. Well, that's really awesome. Thank you. So, yeah. Okay. Anthony? Yeah, I just wanted to say that what you're doing is, this is absolutely seminal work. And uh, you're, the timeliness of this is so critical because you know, we're, as you know, we're starting the School for Extended Learning and, and the, the whole bridge between the non-credit and the credit, that, that nexus where they come together is so, so important. And that's, that transition is where it gets to be difficult. Yeah. And it's a philosophical difference in, in teaching uh, the non-credit world, which is more survival skills mm -hmm. versus, as you point out, the academic skills when it comes to ESL. And, and how do you make that, that bridge is where it gets really tough. And that's where you're where you're headed with all this. So just compliments all the way around to all your work. Fantastic job. Thank you. <clears throat> of course, it takes a village. I mean, I have to say, I, I mean, I had an, an, an idea. It got to be so much bigger, but it's really great that there's this amazing enthusiasm just everywhere about it. And people are talking about professionalism, you know, and, and growth and, um, and, and best practices in the classroom. I mean, it's, it's just great. It's not just, you know, people running into the classroom mm -hmm. to teach and, yeah. Okay, Marianne. Uh, you happen to be talking about an area that I spent 50 years working in, and I am just thrilled with the work you're doing because I have seen so many cases where there was the potential for serious learning and skill development that was not happening because one group or the other group regarded the other group as less mm -hmm. um, professional or whatever. And that building that bridge and making it a logical bridge like you're doing is really fabulous. Thank you very much. Peter. 
I mean, your, your background coming from the Monterey Institute gives us a sense of why you're, you continue to be so interested in this. <clears throat> did, you, did you pick up anything in your study in this past year that uh, prompted you to think, ah, this is a better way of doing it. This is a better way of teaching ESL. Gosh, um, like just in general? Yeah. Um, what, what, what insight did you get personally from this experience about the job that you're doing? <laughs> well, also, I mean, that, you know, we're always learning. And, you know, that just that um, it, it's really about um, creating that community where, and um, I, I don't have it on this presentation over here, but it's one of the presentations that I gave to ESL faculty um, was by, um, and I, I have to pick as his name, um, Farrell. And he has all these different ways uh, for professional development. Um, and it, I have to say, a lot of them was like, wow, I hadn't thought about doing it that way. Um, and so for my own teaching, um, gosh, there have been so many workshops where I thought like, oh, God, I hadn't thought about that. In a, in a while, but to put my finger on it right now, I, um, I mean, I, you know, yeah, <laughs> I've been, I think I've been grading too, <laughs> too long. I'm like, oh, I need to, I need to wrap my brain around that for a minute. Uh, but there have been so many aha moments for me. Uh, and I, I mean, I always feel as a teacher, there's so much to learn. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's really about, you know, talking to each other and, and learning from each other and what are the best practices. And uh, so I think it's been more like visiting the classrooms, um, uh, yeah, seeing different teachers in action and, and having been like, oh, huh, that's a, I like how that person scaffolded all the activities. Um, I, yeah, I actually had that just a few weeks ago when I evaluated a non-credit teacher where she scaffolded a vocabulary lesson so beautifully. And it was, I was like, wow, another one, and another scaffold, and another scaffold. And I'm like, huh, I, you know, I scaffold pretty carefully with things, but I'm like, huh, sometimes maybe it's good to have just this one extra scaffold still with lower level students. Um, because I do a lot of <coughs> higher level classes as well. Um, so maybe that's an example with that. It's good enough. I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, I am such a big fan of project-based learning. I mean, that's like the heart and soul of my mm -hmm. teaching. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I have to say, I mean, it's like seeing the different projects. And, uh, and one of the teachers that I'm preparing this project workshop with for full, um, she figured out a way to incorporate SLOs and EL civics and uh, and the curriculum guidelines and uh, and it was just kind of this beautiful marriage of all these different elements so it's not scattered um, so that was really neat to see um, but yeah I don't know I just feel like I'm always learning with everything um, and this whole project has just been such a huge learning process so, um, but yeah, I don't know. I feel like I should give you a very specific answer and I'm gonna... It may come to you in three to six months. <laughs> <laughs> um, Angie has my number. <laughs> okay, that sounds good, yes. Oh, what's a, what's a uh, Prezi? A Prezi? Yeah. So I love, you know, I, I like having my students do of course, I mean, this is actually <coughs> something they just did this morning in one of my classes. They did prezzies and, and PowerPoint presentations on controversial issues. They have to do primary it's and secondary power, research. PowerPoint it's presentations. Like, it's so like a PowerPoint. It, it lives on the internet, and uh, it's just a kind of a fun way. It's, it's, um, it's more playful, I think, than PowerPoint. Uh. And, uh, and so I like introducing students. So this is a Prezi. This is a Prezi. Okay. So students that have not done a Prezi, 
I, you know, like the scaffolding, right? If they haven't done a PowerPoint, I want them to do a PowerPoint first. But if they've done a PowerPoint before, I want them to challenge themselves with a Prezi. So for me, that's like part of the scaffolding mm -hmm. of kind of this whole, um, you know, going lower tech and high tech <coughs> projects because I want students to be comfortable doing posters, but also technology and Prezi's and creating movies and web pages and all of those different things. Good for you. Very advanced. Thank you. Really wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you so much, Marie. And now another excellent report from Jeff Green on the Promise Program. So while Jeff's walking down here, we had the opportunity this morning to spend some time with Santa Barbara financial planners and put on a presentation for them at the Santa Barbara Club. Went very That's well. Good. Very happy about that. There you go. Thank you for wowing them, Dr. Beebe. They were, <laughs> that was their first chance to meet you for most of them. Uh, so, Madam President, members of the board, President Beebe, thank you for the chance. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, Trustee Gallardo isn't here today since she uh, had brought this up last time, but she also sits on our board now. So she actually has heard this. Uh, so what I wanted to do is uh, offer you two updates, uh, one on the, the basic uh, finances, the foundation for our, our third quarter, um, and then the Promise program itself. So. Starting with uh, the Promise program, uh, I will, and you know, I've been telling people it's not a program. We don't call it a program, but so many people have been calling it a program. I've started calling it a program. <laughs> so please uh, feel free to throw something at me if I do that again. Uh, but you can see here our, our fabulous uh, uh, outgoing uh, academic Senate president uh, here on the cover slide. This is a presentation I've been putting together for a number of organizations in the community and we did use pieces of this this morning. But I thought at this point in the year uh, with, uh, the, with commencement tomorrow we could talk about where we've been. So this is what you already know about the Promise uh, and it was launched in the fall of 16 uh, and it uses all privately raised funds via the foundation to cover all required fees, books, and supplies for any local student. <coughs> Uh, the eligibility requirements, uh, this is where a lot of this year's work went. It was to make sure that these were the right requirements and then, of course, to work with each college department to figure out how do you track, monitor, and, and uh, give a feedback loop that's meaningful to a student if they are or are not meeting a particular requirement. So this will be a work in progress. My guess is forever, uh, but I feel really good about how quickly we ramped up to this level and how... Uh, incredibly helpful, the, the college departments, the, the leads in particular that were part of this uh, along the way were. So uh, from, from IT to uh, academic counseling uh, to the folks in enrollment and admissions and student finance and financial aid, just really working together to figure out every time a bug came up what we would do. We've been speaking about it in these terms, and I've been using these four arguments essentially uh, depending on the audience and depending on the, the conversation and context, but really overarching, uh, the, the promise is an investment in our students, obviously, uh, our families, the families of those students, our community, and ultimately our economy. And so we can make the case for the, the value of this uh, on any of those fronts. The program design and scope, again, you're all familiar with this, and, and we base it on the experience of our predecessors, primarily Ventura, Long Beach, uh, and Cuesta, uh, as well as the National College Promise Campaign. We did a lot of research and homework, put it together, what we thought made the most sense, did a uh, suspension of, of disbelief moment and said, well, if money weren't an issue, what would we do? And then put a price tag on that and ultimately we're delighted to find that we believed we could do that. So rather than compromising uh, the goals based on affordability, we said, well, let's, let's just commit to raising those dollars and so far that is, that is working. Um, we are uh, using, again, this, this overarching model of not introducing a new program, hence my why I don't call it a program, but rather using it as a partner to all of the college's existing work and programs so that we're not creating any new bars, barriers, hoops, you name it, metaphor of your choice, uh, but to actually say we support students through the institution as it is designed by those who know best. And that's really, I think, an important part of this. Here was our budget projection for the year. Uh, we, we believed that if, if all of our guesses and all of our homework were correct, it would be about a $2 million a year project by the time it was fully up and running. That meant this first year was just a $1 million project. I am rounding up uh, for good measure. Uh, but uh, in fact, we found that this is all right. In fact, it's, it's right within a percentage point with one exception, and that is 
uh, we do have a number of students that are not yet, uh, they don't yet have their California residency. So they may have moved, uh, finished high school here, but are not, are, are a semester away from actually being able to claim residency. Um, and so there were a couple of students, and we're really talking a handful, but because of the price differential, there's a little bit more on that front. Again, it's certainly something we can absorb. So we ended up being uh, at about one point, not quite 1.1 million this year, all inclusive. Uh, and so that's really good. Considering the dollar size, getting to, to that is a really good thing. Um, the, the one point I will probably brag about in perpetuity is our guess on uh, books and supplies. Since we could not find a usable workable number anywhere, we asked everybody who uses their estimates and why they use the estimates. Uh, and for various reasons, they weren't quite in parity with what we were talking about. So we just took all that together, said, I, we believe it'll be about $350. It actually was $350.23. Um, <laughs> no joke. Uh, now there's a few bills yet to come in, so maybe we'll be a little bit off, but that, that made the CEO feel really good about the projection, because that is the lion's share of the cost. So having that uh, made us feel like we were on, on the right track. Um, this is the data from the fall cohort. So I'm gonna give you all of the data from the fall cohort, just the, the high points at least, and then I'll give you a snapshot of the spring because it's still in flux. We're not quite done with that. But of 1,421 potentially eligible students, this would be anyone in our local schools who uh, put in their application to potentially attend City College, um, 850 actually followed through and enrolled in the fall term. So that's that really high capture rate that you all know we have between 40 and 50% most years. Uh, of those 850, 756 were an eligible opted in and made the commitment to the promise. That was higher than we thought. We were going on an 80% opt-in rate. We actually got over a 90%. Uh, and again, that's a really good thing. And for some more additional reasons, uh, which I'll tell you in a moment. But that meant that 88, uh, virtually 89% of all eligible enrolled students uh, said, yes, I want to do this. And that was uh, just over 50% of all potentially eligible students in the entire district, whether they came here or not. So those are really good numbers. Um, this is how it broke down by high school. And this is something that uh, we've been, we're going to be continuing to track. But as expected, the three big public high schools in the Santa Barbara district made up the lion's share with uh, Carpinteria as the one public high school in our other neighboring public high school district. If you put all of those together, um, so just the Santa Barbara schools made up 82.5%. And if you add carpentry into it, you're over 90%. Um, so it was overwhelmingly from the large public high schools, which we anticipated. But I was very happy to see that we had nearly 10% of the students from all of the other programs, all the other secondary programs throughout the Santa Barbara um, Community College District. So that included uh, private schools, uh, alternative high schools, home schools, uh, a number of other programs. And you can see there, everybody uh, that was identified is, is on that sheet. So I learned, frankly, of school programs I was completely unaware of as a nearly 30-year resident of the district. So. Uh, that, that's been a great education for us along the way as well. Probably the biggest change there we saw was Bishop Diego um, coming from a, just a handful of students in a typical year to 20 students this year. Uh, and, the, and the really a change in their, the way they see the college and the relationship between their, their counselors, our counselors, and outreach staff as well. Um, so the average unit load, and this is where the, the bonus benefit comes in. Uh, we, of course, designed this to be a minimum of 12 units with a handful of exceptions for DSPS accommodation and other appropriate accommodations. But we ended up actually at 13.4 at census date and 13.5 by the end of the semester. So not only did students enroll full time, but they went above and beyond that. Um, now, of course, the obvious question this is, is that's wonderful. We incentivize correctly according to this. Now, is that sustainable? So that's what we're going to measure going forward. We don't want students to do this just because that's how you access the promise and realize they really can't maintain it. Um, but the ev early evidence is that this does work for the vast majority of students. Um, the additional bonus is this. We went from essentially 11, a little over 11 for this, this cohort on average in units to over 13. That bump in enrollment, so that bump in full-time enrollment, translated to leveraging an additional $500,000 in apportionment. So we were not even thinking about that piece of the puzzle as we designed this, and yet what we've learned is if that remains true, that adds a million dollars of state apportionment funding coming to the college every year starting next year. Um, and so that's, that's an, a wonderful additional benefit that we can now talk about because I think it's important to, to talk about that because it does incentivize all of our local students for full-time enrollment. Um, I, I won't talk about it right now, but, but Dr. Gerald and I and, and Dr. Beebe and others are talking about what, so what could we do for those students that really cannot do full-time? 
um, what accommodation could we make for different kinds of scheduling blocks or what have you going forward and I know there's a few grants the district is is pursuing so what we may be able to talk about in the future but for now this is the design and that's the result uh, bog waiver eligibility another really happy thing for us we built the economic model assuming that that stayed constant at 66 percent uh, and so we made it a requirement that all students had to ask for it. It didn't matter if they got it or not, but we wanted to make sure that they went through the process. So if there was state funding that could be accessed, they would access it. We did not do that with Pell Grants. We did not do that with Cal Grants. We just said the BOG waiver in particular needed to be uh, maintained. And sure enough, look at that number, 66.32. Uh, and this is the breakdown of all the different BOG waiver types that that were used. Um, some other just data about the cohort, uh, just under 10% are registered with DSPS in this first semester, 14% with EOS, EOPS programs, and uh, just about 1.5% with the athletic programs. So we are starting to, to monitor that, track that, and try to knit that together so that we know which students are taking advantage of what other supports, especially when it comes to DSPS and EOPS, uh, because we also have our academic counselors. So we, you know, are they academic are, are they accessing their academic counseling through one of these programs, through academic counseling, or through another, another way, or maybe multiple, and what works best? Uh, this is about their majors, which we wanted to track. We thought this was just really interesting at this point. We don't have much to say about it other than to say these were the top majors uh, in rank order of all of these uh, promised students. Business administration being number one by a long shot at 82 majors. Uh, biology, biological sciences at 59. Nursing, uh, the ADN program at 58. Undeclared, my favorite major at 44, uh, psychology 41, engineering 40, and, and on down. So uh, that gives you a sense of what the students, at least when they walk in the door, are thinking they want to be doing. Um, now, moving to the spring cohort, here's what we found with our first measure of persistence. Uh, we found that of the 756 students who enrolled as a promise in fall, 642, so 85%, also met the requirements and re-enrolled for spring in the promise program. So it's an 85% persistence rate. That is slightly better than the average overall, but it's also in flux because right now we do have a petition process. So if something happened in, this, in the fall semester, we allow students always to petition and say, well, this is what happened and this is why I still want to remain part of the promise. So that number will likely tick up. Um, 93 new students, however, also joined the Promise program in spring. Remember, we said there's a, essentially we started with a 12-month window. We had to convert that to a next two primary semesters window for, that, that's the technical definition. So if you graduate in June from your high school, uh, you have fall or spring to enroll in the Promise and, and start it. And so if you do that simple math, as we've just done for you on the screen, uh, 849 unduplicated students um, that are part of the Promise program in this first year. And that is actually uh, increasing as we speak. Um, this was the spring data. You can see a bump up in potentially eligible, and that we, we do attribute <coughs> some of that to the promise itself and the awareness of it so that more students from the district are saying, gosh, I might want to do this. I'm going to open the door so I can consider it. Um, again, we couldn't prove that, but that seems to be a reasonable explanation. Uh, but the numbers are pretty solid. Uh, it's 746 uh, right now. Actually, I was just told this morning it was 749. Uh, with some of the recent petitions. So it's basically a solid 750 per semester. And if that holds, uh, especially if we know that there's some replacement from one to the, to the next, that we are talking about probably 1,600 students a year once we get into next year that will be part of the program. And that's just what we tell everybody in the world they can do to talk to us about it. So um, questions or comments about that? I know that was a brief but quick run through, but that, that's sort of what we know so far. Um, yeah. Do you <clears throat> is this presentation available? I mean, you, there were a lot of numbers there. I'd really I really like. I can make it available to any. Like, we can send it to you. It's kind of, it's sort of changing weekly because the numbers change. But I'm happy to send it to anyone that wants it, or come to any meeting or group and and give it. I think it'd be helpful to give it to Angie, and she can put it on with as at a later post with the agenda. To, Absolutely. For the happy public. Happy to do that. Yeah. Were there were there any surprises to you? I think I, we were pleasantly surprised, though we did hedge a bit. We, w the fact that 90% of all of our local students took us up on the offer was a, was a bit of a surprise. Um, I think the margin over the full-time enrollment average, because that, that was, you're looking there at, at the mean. And so with that as the mean, you, you know that some students are really quite a ways above that. Um, I think the summer numbers, in fact, I just got these from Lucille as I walked over. The summer enrollment numbers, we, because we offer summer as a way to keep students on track, but we don't require it. Well, we have in summer one, as of today, 290 of these students 
already enrolled. And they're enrolled anywhere from a half unit to 10, 10 and a half units, or, or I'm sorry, nine units. In summer two, there's 218 already enrolled, and they're enrolled between uh, 0.7 and 10.5 units. So the students, a third of our students in the Promise program are taking advantage of, of one or both summer sessions uh, to keep their, their momentum going. So that, that's, that's really good. I, I actually was not expecting that many. Um, other than that, I, and how close we were on the book estimate, I don't think we, we know what other surprises there are yet. Um, but we are, we're, you know, it's, it's sort of an everyday study. So the two million uh, cost of this thing when you're up and running for all in, yeah. does that count summers? Or it is that It does because of the way we price it out. What ra when, in our basic model, what we did is say we took 60 units as a compl a average round completion number and divided it in four. So the, the semesters are based on a 15 unit average, gotcha. which is why the variation is not as big as it would otherwise be given that a number of the students um, were paying non-resident for their first semester and then resident their second semester. And again, it's, it's, we're talking, I think it was eight students, but because of the margin in that budget, that does make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, we, I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, you know, we did have some expenditures this year that are, you're not seeing there on, you know, the video that we produce. Actually, there's some 30 second spots that are on in rotation right now, you may have seen. Uh, we, we actually are the beginning, today is the beginning of a six week community media push. So we've got uh, five radio spots, two television spots, and a great deal of digital out there over the, <coughs> through mid-June. Uh, because we really, until now, have been on the inner inner circle with the fundraising, and this is the first time we're putting it out in the community and saying, "Depends on your support. Please join us." Is sort of the tagline, and and that's what we're going to see. We can we can gather more allies that way. Great. Great. Anyone else? All right. Um, as a side note, I'll say that there are two things before I move to my other brief report on numbers. Uh, we have, I, I, I'm going to be speaking to the Los uh, Rios district. They've asked, uh, they're doing a strategic plan around their promise programs. They've asked for us to come up and speak with them. So that's, that's going to be um, good uh, as a way to sort of trade notes with a, a peer elsewhere in the state. And then we are also part of the Promise Gathering, which is now scheduled for August 30th, I just learned today, for sure. Uh, and that was, there's only been, other, been one other, and that was in Oakland uh, last year. And so we're going to be um, presenting there as well. Um, and, and right now in the state, we're pushing 30 Promise programs. So we've gone from three to 30 in just under two years, well, really 18 months, and we're one of those. So it's, there's a lot of momentum in California, in particular. That's great. Uh, Great. Okay. Oh, that, that's Can I? Yes, let's find it. This was the uh, March. Oh, it's the far left document, March 2017. There, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to give the brief quarterly report. Uh, again, no surprises here, except uh, it's a really positive one, especially when comparing to last year. Our balance sheet, the markets have been really good to the foundation, as you might expect with the, uh, the last six months of the investment environment. Uh, what that means is that our net assets have gone from about 52 million to about 55 million. Um, and that's, that's mostly market forces that, have, that account for that. Um, our operating expenses are remain under budget. We're doing what we did last year, which is try to keep them about 5% under the budget on the expense side, and then try to uh, keep the income as high as we can. If you go to the next sheet, this is actually the contributions report. And um, is there any way to make that bigger, Liz, at all? Otherwise, I can just... Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like that. Those, those are the key parts right there. So what we've done is we'll start to break out our report. So you can see the Promise is a standalone. It's, it's really a bridge program from our perspective. It's not direct student support exclusively, and it's not a college program exclusively, which is the old categorizations we use. So we're going to flesh that out since it's going to have such a big piece of, of our books for the coming years. Um, but what you can see there, if you go to total contributions, at this point last year we were at 1.5 million. This year we're at almost 2.9. Uh, and so last year was slow at this point, uh, to be fair, so that, that's just a one-year comparison, but uh, this is exactly where we want to be for this point in the year. So we've had a really good year, in particular on the income side with unrestricted support and promise support, um, and uh, the student support numbers uh, go up and down as we get large multi-year commitments, and the promise uh, is, is part of that as well. So you can see that's translated into the green and blue bars below. Um, and the blue is the goal for the year, and the green is where we stand as of March 31. So you can see we're well over in the other unrestricted category. We're um, right on schedule for the 
uh, visionary circle, which is the middle, and then the overall, the, the bigger dollars that come in for student and college support program support, uh, we're essentially right on track with where we would want to be at this point. Uh, April was actually a really good month for us, and that's not reflected here. So we received uh, uh, nearly three quarters of a million dollars in some major new scholarship gifts. Um, so I, I feel good about where we're going to end this year. And that's where we're at. Well, thank you. If you can also provide that one to Angie, and then we'll get it all posted. We'll do so. And uh, right. maybe you could, uh, we're, we're doing some budget projections too, and maybe Lindsay would like to work with you since you <laughs> seem to have a really good track record here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Down to 23 cents. <laughs> L Lindsay and I bonded last year over trying to mesh our, our budgets. So yes, we will, we will we'll do that. All right, thank you all. Right. Thanks, Jeff. Jeff. And speaking of budgets, now Lindsay. <laughs> so Lindsay's been on the phone and trying to figure out what the, uh, the May Revise is all about and how it impacts us. And so this will be a little bit of a combination report of all the components of the budget, which normally we don't do at this point in time, but we're, we're doing it this time. And we're also going to be integrating and she'll be talking about some of the major major implications of the May revise that just came out today. Okay. Okay. I feel like I have a ton to go over, which is why I have it kind of all laid out over here and so I can <laughs> find it quickly. I, uh, tonight's one of the nights I miss our fiscal subcommittee meetings because <laughs> we have a lot to cover and um, you know it'll be a good chat. So let's see what I should start with here. You can go to Liz, a couple more pages past this first cover sheet another one okay stay here for a second um, I just want to start off by explaining that this is our first draft of our tentative budget seeing all the components were early in the process because the May revise was announced today um, there's a handful of changes in there so very very tentative draft here with with many of the files and I'll tell you where we're at with each one this first one is a restricted and unrestricted combined just to give everyone an idea of how much money we have overall. Um, this is not a real helpful slide to go through in great detail because, because the two items are combined, but just to give the public an idea that we have $111 million uh, worth of revenues coming in for restricted and unrestricted combined. Okay, the next one, please, Liz. So this overall slide on the unrestricted general fund we saw last time for the first time have handy the details in case we need to go over any of them right now in case we have any questions about the revenues or the expenditures right now is probably a good time for me to talk a little bit about the May revise and how it's going to change these numbers so did everybody already read the May revise I don't, no news okay news to some of you great I love sharing good news some good news uh, May revise is not too terribly complicated. Our good news is that there's going to be an additional uh, revenue coming in the form of more base apportionment. So this is very good news for us. It's about $2 million for our, our district. So there's our piece of good news. They also have a COLA that they've put in there of 1.54%. That went up a little tiny bit. So a little bit more good news. That equates to about a million dollars for us. Okay. And the other piece of news, which is a, a good and bad, it's not, not my favorite news, is on the deferred maintenance and instructional equipment funding. They decided to increase that quite a bit. It's $1.6 million for us, but not to fund it until 1819. I was really looking forward to getting some of those funds to help with deferred maintenance for us next year, um, but we'll have to revisit that, that concept. So that's my one uh, bad news for today. So that's just a quick, quick review of the, the main revi revision. I'll, uh, I'll bring some documentation next time that I can post so you know, the public can see how it impacts us and do my usual little write-up. But I know everybody's anxious to hear news when it happens. So that's our quick news. So the revenue that is an increase here, that's not none of the May revision information is built in here. So we'll see the apportionment revenue go up $2 million. Okay, so that's, that's going to help there with that decline that we've been uh, looking at on the revenues. It's also going to help with the projections, which we don't have built quite yet. We're waiting for the May revise to do the projections. 
On the expense side, uh, no, no new changes here at this point. It's uh, premature to, to go into any of those details there, but we'll have some changes in the expense side as well. And I think we'll continue on to some of the other slides that will discuss the transfers. But before we move on, yeah. would you mind just running down that, that variance line <coughs> and giving us the very big picture again on what most of those differences are? Like, mm -hmm. I assume, for example, the, the 9 million now, maybe 7 million difference in revenue mm -hmm. is uh, dropping enrollment projections. You've got it. So we had, of the 9.7 million there on state, almost 8 million of that was the decline in enrollment due, and decline in apportionment due to the decline in enrollment of 8.3%. Um, that's one. Offsetting that is an increase in local property tax. And then we have decreases in EPA, the Prop 30 revenues, because the sales tax portion is ending. That was a decrease of 1.9 million. Uh, another High level one is the what we've built into the assumptions, the out-of-state enrollment decline of 5% and an international enrollment decline of 15%. That's a $1.7 million decrease that we have built into the assumptions at this point. And then on the expenditure side, the similar kind no, of No questions picture. about the revenues, that, that helps. But then this that'll change by the $2 million I just mentioned. Okay. On the expense side, let's see, there's so many details on here. Just want to hit the large ones. Just the big ones. Yeah. yeah, on the expense side, remember that the SERP retirement, all of the mm -hmm. folks leaving, that's all built into here. So that's a big adjustment to our salaries. We also have the usual step increases in longevity built in, which are always increases to our salary budgets. We also have built in uh, to the expense side the starting up, the implementation of the School of Extended Learning and the related salaries for that. That's about $350,000 there. Uh, we have a decrease in the cost for adjunct salaries due to the declining enrollment. That's uh, about $1.3 million decline. So similar decline for summer salaries, decrease of about 400000 there. Okay, one that I do want to point out here, we have built into the budget at this point in time pretty much a, a flat change on the hourly budgets. And we do have built into the budget assumptions that we'd be decreasing the hourlies by 10%. We've been really crunching our numbers looking at that. Paul Gerald's been fantastic trying to help vet those numbers and see if we can get to that 10% decreased assumption that we're shooting for. So that will change. I don't want to we haven't quite figured out exactly what we're going to do there, but the hourly budget assumption probably will not end as a decrease in 10%. We probably won't be able to make that goal. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, stirs and purrs are, uh, you know, fun ones to talk about there. We have those rate increases, which are quite large. Stirs is four and a half, four hundred thousand dollars, and purrs is another two hundred thirty thousand. So a lot of increases there for stirs and purrs. We've been expecting that, unfortunately. We have a health and welfare increase due to the increased costs in medical uh, expenses of almost 5%. That comes out to about $400,000 as well. So those are the, those are the large ones. A, a savings we have is we've changed our lottery fund budget allocation process, and we have moved the instructional supply budgets out of the general fund and into the lottery fund this year, and that's going to save us about a half million dollars this year paying for it out of the lottery fund instead of paying for it out of the general fund. So that's a new process we've been working on through BRAC, our Budget Resource Allocation Committee. So the <coughs> supplies and materials line has a pretty big change. Decrease, Decrease, yes. and you're saying that's been moved over to the lottery money. Mm -hmm. You got okay, it. Okay, good. That's why. If we hadn't used the lottery money in, in really an efficient way in terms of transferring expenses, these kind of expenses, supplies and materials, off this uh, general fund unrestricted account to uh, that in the past and so now um, that's what we've done and it's really helped a lot I mean you can see the difference there mm -hmm. okay you ready to any more questions about that this section before I move on um, anything on the transfers out well there's a whole slide on that one a little easier okay. to see on there yeah I'll if go you don't with mind that. We'll go with this one. Yeah, I want to say a couple things about that when we get there. Yeah. Okay. Peter? 
Was your assumption on the cost of the, <coughs> the SERP in excess of what you anticipated? No, actually, the SERP calculations overall, <coughs> how many people retired, um, mm -hmm. how many people we were going to replace, the cost, all came in very close to our project our assumptions from way back at the very first time we looked at it. So no, no changes there. We were very, very, very relieved. Going to save a little more money than our first uh, first look. <coughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. There's, I know, there's a lot to look at. And I'm just still not as exciting. My presentations are not as fun as sabbatical <coughs> presentations. I've got to work on that. <laughs> I've got to do a prezi. She's making me look mm -hmm. bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, next one, please, Liz. Okay, this is just the restricted funds. At this point in time, it is so hard to, to budget our restricted funds. Previ prior to the May revise, we really don't know where our grants are gonna be landing. This just kind of gives us a general idea of, of how large those dollars are and uh, approximately how they're being allocated. This will be updated um, quite a bit for the final budget in September. So not a lot to talk about here and not, not a lot of changes either. So you can go, you can keep going, okay. So our fund balances, something we've studied many, many times. This is a, an update here. And I'll do a quick refresher of, of what this slide is telling us. That first line is the state mandated contingency. So the state mandates that we have 5% in our reserves uh, of our expenditures. So that's just a, a calculation there. If you look at how much our expenditures are, we need to have 5% of those and we have that listed here. The next in our reserve policy is that we reserve for bank TLUs. That number's about a one and a half million dollars, fluctuates very, very little year over year. Uh, if there are going to be general apportionment deferrals, we put them here. That's per our board policy, but there haven't been any for a while, so that's not listed here. And instead of listing our general apportionment deferrals, we have an additional reserve of 15% to meet our, our board policy, and that's been about uh, 14 million so you can see that the total designated reserve we have is $20 million here for our general fund. That next line is just the math between what our total fund balance is and what's not designated. So back in 1516, we ended that year with an undesignated balance of 11 million, giving us a $31 million fund balance for the general fund. 1617, we had, did have a deficit in our budget last year and our actual spend at the end of the year. So you see that decline down to seven million. And for our tentative budget for 2017-18, we have our $5 million deficit that we're aware of. And so you just see that declining by another $5 million. So we're still above our board minimum required amount, but our undesignated amount is, is dwindling. And then you can see the related percentages down below. Oh. Um, one thing I'm thinking about is we have not, of course, gotten to June 30th. We're calculating as of June 30th here. Mm -hmm. And um, and I know it takes a while to get to the end of that fiscal year as you finish up those calculations. So the, yeah. the big picture question would be, do you expect any major changes um, in those numbers? Uh, are we fairly in the ballpark? Yeah. yeah, no major changes expected at this time. Not That's for June 30th, for this 17, yeah. 2017. No, nothing, nothing that I've seen at all, no. Anybody else? No. Okay, all right, we can go on to the next one, which is the transfer slide. Okay, so there's some, you know, it's worth paying attention to the slide for a minute and studying the history because we've had so many changes with our transfers. Um, on average, we transfer from the general fund out to the construction and equipment fund. That's kind of our normal transfers. Here, we haven't had that normal dynamic. It was back in 1415 when that was kind of our norm. So 1516, you see a lot of large dollar amounts for specific projects we had going on at that time. I, I, I won't waste my time explaining all those, but that was an unusual year. 1617 was also an unusual year because we had to transfer 2.8 million to the West Campus project because we need to expend more than the bond monies that we had available. So that was an additional unusual year. 
In 1617, we reduced the transfers to the construction fund for district, district projects, that first line, and we reduced it down to kind of the bare minimum of what we need for emergencies when uh, boilers go down, chillers go down, there's you know something that we need to, to repair immediately. We did need a transfer there to the construction fund to cover those kinds of costs. So uh, we also always have the Children's Center transfer of 200,000. That's very consistent that we need to backfill that program. So I want to I want to talk just a second about this because um, I told Lindsay I wanted to zero everything out except for the Children's Center Fund um, to enable us to do a deeper dive on on really what it is that we're projecting to have uh, relative to you know some kind of a, a fund there that would be more reflective of um, the real needs of, of the college going forward. We had, as Lindsay points out, we had two unusual years here where we had capital expenditures that were um, paid for uh, out of the general fund. And so it kind of, uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that we were being as prudent as we possibly could in coming up with an estimate. So I tell you that because it's important to realize that if you go back to the general fund unrestricted account and the $5 million, $4.9 million deficit that we have, that's actually understated because we would have to, um, we'll have to build in um, about $670,000 as our contingency emergency fund. We'll have to put that in there. Probably also around 70,000 for the development of our facilities master plan, which we're planning on getting done this, this year as well. So, you know, I mean, you can probably say that, you know, we're looking at about $800,000 or so that we'll want to add back to the to the five million dollar uh, expenditure, you know, making that you know closer to to five point eight million uh, deficit. Of course, that doesn't that doesn't reflect the the good news that we got today about the the two point one million right. that we'll get from uh, the May revised money. But I just wanted to be as a matter of full disclosure. I wanted to make sure that you understood what I was doing with with uh, the the transfers uh, out here. Yeah. Any questions on that? So what you're saying is basically that for these transfers for a construction um, and equipment for that matter, you're, you're basically doing a zero-based budgeting on, in those areas. Exactly. And then you're going to build it back with a specific understanding of what and why. Right. Okay. So that we can get a solid handle on what's, what's, uh, what our expenditures are going to be going forward. And the goal would be to have a going forward number that is sustainable, that is the number that we live on in the future, right? In other words, Yeah, I mean, barring any, anything right. you know, strange happening, but I mean... No, I bet I mean the goal is to figure out what we need to, to have a balanced budget. Yeah, as, yeah. A, as a contingency fund, and, yeah. and you know, we've talked about somewhere around 670000 mm -hmm. for boilers breaking and chillers blowing up or whatever happens. Mm -hmm. So we just have to get some experience with that particular fund, and that. And you're absolutely right. We're we're, we're kind of doing a, a zero-based budgeting right here on this part now, mm -hmm. so it will add to the to the deficit going forward. Okay. Okay. Good on the transfers for now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next one, Liz. <coughs> So th this slide here is a combination of many, many funds that we just kind of try and categorize by their, by their category. And we don't go into a whole lot of detail on these, but it's nice to point out that we, give, we provide $32 million in financial aid to our students. If you see that financial aid line, that's something to be you know, pretty proud of. A couple million dollars in scholarships as well. Um, Fund 79, the special trusts and co-curriculars, those are our you know, various trusts that we have throughout the college for different programs. And then the student pl club accounts that we also help the, the students have their clubs. They have their money that, that we hold in trust for them. And then CLL has their trust for various programs. And what that's showing there with CLL is basically they get a, a handful of donations every year. It's quite normal to be about $100,000. And then they spend it all in that year. So you see it coming in and going right back out. Um, the ending fund balance on that CLL trust is a million dollars and that is their rainy day fund is included in there so I know we're all kind of familiar with that I want to point that out and so you can see where it's at in here 
that's about it for that group. This next one. Okay. Campus <coughs> door. This is a this is one that's very early with a um, retail operation such as this is very nice to finish the year before you try and start budgeting for the next year. So this is just a first draft, <coughs> um, but the store is is open. I hope you visit it. If you haven't, please please come visit it. We're quite excited about it being open and and it's it's beautiful. And the uh, new coffee venue in there that's proudly serving Starbucks coffee is going well. People are excited they can get their Starbucks coffee here on campus. So uh, the bookstore budget is looking looking much better for last year than the swing space dynamic we had to weather this year. And also the increased revenues we're receiving from the Promise students is, is showing here as well. So you see the revenues coming up quite a bit and that's primarily from Promise uh, revenues. So that's, that's great news. But I do have a lot more coming on the Campus Store Fund. Um, we've just finally gotten our new accounting software fully implemented that we're using there and working, which is great. And for the um, presentation I'm going to provide at a later date when all the budget work is done, I'm going to have a couple slides specific to the campus fund, store fund, the ending fund balance and the reserves. Is a little, it is a little complex. These reserves are different than our other funds because it's an enterprise fund. So I have some additional details coming to the public and the board about that to help all of us understand the project, how much the project cost, and uh, things of that nature. I do want to point out on 1516, the year 1516, the actuals, that $500,000 transfer in, that was a transfer in from the lottery fund for them to get that bookstore rental, uh, book rental program going. So not related to the $500,000 loan that I know we've talked about a lot. That doesn't show up on here because that was a loan that's on the balance sheet, not in the P&L. Um, they will be paying us back that loan this year, so that'll be, that'll be gone. It was just for cash flow help while they um, you know, had to purchase all their books and pay for the construction at the same time. So this will be updated probably, probably a fair amount, so expect to see some changes here for the final version. Okay. Food service is next, right? I kind of have a similar story with food service. This is a rough draft. Um, you know, they don't have any interesting remodel projects going on right now, but they did have, you know, kind of a slow year, not knowing if we we're going to be moving or not. Um, but at least they're projecting to be a break even for next year, but we're going to revisit that more because we have a lot of changes to venues and changes with the um, vacancy we have with the Director of Food Service Program, you know, new directions, new ways to try and make revenues for the, for the district. So. That's that one. What do we have next? Oh, satellite services. This is a fund we did carve out a couple of years ago, specific to the coffee uh, shops that we have around campus. So the, really what you're seeing here is, is coffee, um, including the uh, coffee venue in the bookstore. I'm trying not to call it the Starbucks because it's not officially a Starbucks. It's a we proudly serve Starbucks coffee. Um, so all of that is in here. I know it sounds so silly, but I want to be, I want to be technically correct. We can't put a big Starbucks sign outside. So, you know, I heard when you Google map Starbucks, it won't come up, darn. Um, so this is basically showing us that it's, it's kind of a break even budget with the coffee and we're still working on that. And we're hoping that the, the new Starbucks is going to help with the revenues there as well. Okay, fleet services, this is not even really worth talking about. It's something we had to carve out, um, but it's just our fleet. We, we now rent vehicles, or lease them, I should say, instead of purchase them. That's helping um, keep our equipment in good operating condition. You know, we have newer vans, newer, newer cars, uh, and, and that just is falling in this fund, so. Let's see, we have CLL next. Okay. Did, did we make that decision on the basis of um, a preference for modernity or was it simply less expensive? For more what? I'm sorry, I missed what you said. Did, did, we, did we do it because the cars last longer? Or well, did we do it be, in, or, in order to save money? We did it in order to save money, have newer, safer cars. We were mm -hmm. keeping our cars. They were really, really old, and then it was costing us money to maintain them. Yeah. Through this program, we don't have to pay for all this maintenance and then have this 10-year-old car. We turn it back in, we get a new one, and it also saves money. So we have newer, safer vehicles that are more up-to-date. We don't have to maintain them. They do that for us, 
and it costs us less money. So it's kind of a win-win all overall. Good. Yeah. Okay, CLL, this budget, a lot of work was put into this budget because of the work happening right now with the School of, of Extended Learning. So this does incorporate changes related to the School of Extended Learning, carving out that. That's why you see some changes here in the revenue side as well as the expense side. That's, that's um, Andy Harper working very hard to come up with what we really think the CLL budget will be for next year with this change and the implementation of, CL, of SEL. Uh, so we do have about $300,000 coming out in the revenue section, um, also expenditures coming out um, related to that, and then still showing them breaking even. So even though it's early and this is a draft, this is actually a pretty, a, a pretty solid one. I don't expect any more changes to this one going forward. You know, just to comment on this, you know, as Lindsay points out, Andy really has put in many, many hours figuring all of this out. And what you're looking at here is the beginning of a winding down process for the CLL and a spooling up essentially for the School for Extended Learning. You know, that'll take a couple years. We're looking at a couple years. It's not gonna be anything immediate, but, but that's what we're looking at here is, is a kind of a winding down of this. Andy's doing a great job with all of that. Okay, I think we'll carry on. We just have a few more to look at the children's center fund uh, not a lot of changes in the children's center fund year on year um, nothing too critical here to address they've had some changes in their academic salaries with people retiring and um, so you see some reductions there but nothing nothing too substantial here and this one will get updated again after the end of the year we always get more uh, solid final numbers at the end of the year for that fund all right, next one. Okay, so here's another slide. I apologize. It's a lot of funds listed all together, for lack of a better way to, to show this. Um, n there's really nothing too terribly new here with any of these. These are pretty uh, consistent every year. The one that's that is substantially different is the lottery so much so that actually I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it out of here for next version and have a full page for lottery with our new funding and allocation program we really need to see this level of detail on the lottery fund so that one will come out but you do see in here since we're on and I'll give you a quick uh, bit of information on lottery you see we get about 480,000 a year on lottery and revenues and what we're projecting this at this point, which is early, we're actually going to work on this a little more and probably bring it down. But we're projecting that we're going to spend a million dollars next year in lottery. So we know that's more than our normal annual revenue. But we're doing that very purposely and intentionally to spend that down because we have the funds there and we know we have a deficit in the general fund. So we've allocated about a million to spend there. You see how it shows that it's a negative 500 and it's bringing us down to an ending fund balance that is intentionally about one year's worth of uh, revenue. So we want to kind of have a minimum fund balance in there of one year's worth of revenue, about a half million dollars every year. So that's what we're looking at in that fund. Okay. Um, I think that's about all that's worth pointing out here, except for maybe the School of Culinary Arts. It's just important to remember that we did change our accounting process to be in, in compliance with the BAM, the Budget Accounting Manual, and pulled it out of the general fund. So the revenue off of the venues, basically the JSB, is now listed separately here and not in the general fund. But they don't quite break even, but they, they lose a little bit of money every year. That's kind of the normal. Okay. We're getting there. Insurance funds, honestly, there's very, very little to say about this. This is where payments come in and out. We can kind of breeze by that one. Same with the bond and interest, bond interest and redemption fund. The bond is winding down. If you go to the next one, Liz, you can see that by the end of this year, we should have spent, we will have spent all of the money. Um, that project on West Campus is just about done. We're very excited. It will be occupied for spring 2017. We're working on ordering the, some of the furniture today, so it's getting to the fun part. Um, so next year we won't, we won't be seeing the Measure V bond uh, budget anymore. There are two tabs that are normally on here that I know you all 
um, would be expecting to see right now, and that's the construction and equipment tabs. We intentionally didn't include them. It was just too early because without the May revise, we weren't sure how much money we would have for um, equipment and uh, maintenance. So there was too many zeros and unsure numbers. We didn't want to put it on here and um, you know have to explain quite yet. So we'll see that for next time, but the construction equipment funder are very important and we'll look at that. I think I have a couple more things I want to say here. A couple reminders that I'll be presenting to the board again um, May 25th. We'll go through this one more time with all the May revise information built in. And then June 22nd is the approval of the tentative budget where I'll be presenting again, um, probably a more interesting PowerPoint type version along with the projections, the five-year projections. So you'll get to see that too. And next week, we do have the budget forum on May 18th at noon in this room. If anyone wants to come, that would be great. We did make a um, decision to just have one budget forum and stream it live or record it. And that way, a lot of people have the option to do it. I've historically done two, one one week and one the next week. And um, you know, it's, it's always, I always feel bad because these great questions get asked at one and then not at the other, and people don't know what was asked. And we, uh, I think it was Luz came up with this great idea to just record it and stream it on YouTube. I think that's going to be fantastic. I think that way a lot more people will be able to view it at their own convenience. So that's what we're going to be doing for the, for the budget forum. And I will be presenting for the budget forum, basically the budget presentation, which is a little bit of a change. When I first started here a few years ago, the budget forums were a lot of uh, past data. And now we're just going to be talking about the budget, trying to get that information out so people understand where we're at. What was the date of that? Uh, May 18th. 18th. Yeah. yeah. At noon. If you could come, that'd be wonderful. I would love to have you. You can come ask me a bunch more questions. And where? Here. Right here. Yeah, right here. Yeah. When will the streaming be available? Live stream know. right then, I guess. Right, right then. I think they're trying to figure that out. They, IT hasn't promised me if they can stream it live or if they're going to record it. We're working okay. on it. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure yet. Yeah, we're getting the Clyde. thumbs up from Clyde. They're going to stream it. Great. <laughs> yeah. Good. Your lunch date is set. Yeah. <laughs> Or you can just sit at home and watch it on YouTube. <laughs> but then you can't ask me questions. Well, I, I won't be able to be here, so that's oh. why I was very interested. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Questions? Comments? How are, how are we reaching out <coughs> to those who might be interested in attending so that they know that this is going to go on? Well, we'll, we're sending out messages and such. Yeah. You know, all to the faculty, staff, the community. Well, we could get it in the bridge. Yeah, we can get it in the bridge so it goes out to the community. Yeah. Okay. I think it's really important to take that extra step to ensure that it isn't just a, a passing thing. We really need to tell the community that this event, this is, this is important. It's easy enough for people to complain about stuff that they don't understand. I'd like us to be able to say, well, we did have this. It was well advertised, and you could either see it live, or you could see it streaming, or you could see it later. Uh, I want us to have those answers for people. Um, okay. Thank you, Dr. Haslam, for that, because, you know, I mean, frankly, we're quite proud of the work that we're doing with the budget. I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a different level of transparency. We're scrutinizing every single line item, I mean, as we should do. And, you know, I'm real proud of the work that Lindsay's done and actually the entire staff in terms of, of how we pulled this all together. I mean, in a difficult situation, as you know. Not only that, but I understand it. There you go. <laughs> this is pretty amazing, you know? Well, that's really good because this is part of the reason we decided to bring it back to the full board rather than have the subcommittee and so that everybody could get their chance to it ask worked. questions. It worked. Yeah. That's yeah, it did work. I couldn't agree more. I you know that it was if you weren't on that finance committee, you know, you just saw a couple of slides in here and that was when we'd have the meetings and if you didn't really if you weren't really looking or didn't want to look at it, you wouldn't really be 
you wouldn't know what was going on. And you also wouldn't know that some of us were not too happy because we couldn't get some of the questions answered. And um, so this, is, uh, this level of transparency is critical. I know it's time consuming in these meetings for everybody to have to sit here and look at all these slides and all these pages and really pretend or at least try to understand them all. And it's not so easy to get, to, to get a grip on, on all of it. I, um, but it, it's really, it's one of our prime responsibilities and we need to have a grip on this. So I'm, um, I'm very pleased that this is happening. Yeah, and Lindsay has really gotten good at figuring out our questions <laughs> in advance. <laughs> so there are times when I want to when I want to pick up a phone and call Lindsay and go, yeah. I don't quite understand this page. <laughs> you know, and you need help? Let me just ask me so I can answer it. I, I, if I don't know the answer, I'll figure it out. Um, I, another thought occurred to me when you mentioned scrutinizing the budget in new ways. The BRAC committee. You might remind us about that. I'll, I'll oh, let man. Lindsay have every, the honors. Yeah, every time someone says BRAC, I light up, which is like another one of those nerdy things, you know. Um, BRAC is the Budget Resource Allocation Committee. Um, when Dr. Beebe started, he, I don't know, it was like the first week he was here, he was like, hey, Lindsay, you guys don't have this committee. And I said, what committee? He goes, it's, it's called the Budget Resource Allocation Committee. I said, that sounds wonderful. I want it. I'll start it. <laughs> I'm so excited. Uh, so what it is is we, we started... Um, we started kind of late in the game with the budget development process, but we wrote the guidelines, we got it going, and they're only about, we started probably only about a month late for what they should be doing on a normal annual basis, and, but we, we did it anyways. And what we've done is we've got four all day long Friday meetings where they review every single budget of every department in the college. And it's a, it's a shared governance committee. It's a subcommittee of CPC. So we have the two faculty, the two ALC, um, two classified staff, et cetera. Um, I'm the chair of the committee. And it's been just a great group. The group is really excited to learn about all the different departments' budgets, what they do, why they need the money. Maybe they don't need the money. Uh, so it's been very collegial, very positive, but a lot of joking about, hey, Dr. Gerald, why do you need that money there? <laughs> and he's like, because, and we're going, okay, we'll cut that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a great process. It's something that um, the budget really can't be looked at in that kind of detailed level without a committee like that. You know, the accounting staff can point things out, why is this here, but, um, you know, it's hard to make any changes without a committee looking at it. So it's exciting. And the committee will go all year long. This is our, our busy time with those four all-day meetings. But the rest of the year we'll be meeting, reviewing budgets as well, uh, looking to see if people are staying in line. And uh, if any emergency budget requests come in, we would, we would uh, review those requests and then recommend them to CPC or not. Uh, so kind of... Uh, Kind of reminds me of the old fiscal subcommittee of the board. Now CPC has a subcommittee that's really focused on the budget because CPC just can't focus on this level of detail. Um, and it gives the community throughout the district more opportunity to learn about the budget. Another group of people who can say, hey, I understand the budget and this is what's happening. So it's really helpful. Two quick comments on this. Uh, first of all, Kudos to Lindsay. When I first mentioned the whole idea of a, of a resource allocation committee that we had in San Diego, um, she changed the name to Budget Resource Allocation Committee. She, she actually met with my chief business officer um, at San Diego City College, Sahara Wan, and uh, they kind of had a mind meld and came up with uh, how it might work for us here. That, that's the good news. The bad news is, is that she cut my budget uh, and the president's office, yeah, but and his. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's okay though. It's all for a good cause. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just as as susceptible to to BRAC as anybody else. Just thought I'd let everybody know that. <laughs> okay. Any other okay. questions? Yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. Really appreciate this. And I appreciate getting it now so that I feel like when we get to adopting it, we're going to be very familiar. Great. OK, our next item is uh, job descriptions for the legislative liaison and K-12 representatives. Um, Veronica had supplied the, the K-12 draft, I think. Marianna and Veronica are the two reps that we have. Um, and kind of as an introductory 
comment, I think we have a big difference in the two drafts <laughs> between these guys. And I'm looking for something that's more consistent between them. Um, so the idea occurred to me that we could discuss these in con concept and then send them to Dr. Beebe f to kind of put them in a similar format and maybe integrate them now with our um, annual, our policy on what happens annually where currently we say we have subcommittees, we've suspended those subcommittees and appointed liaisons in certain areas and so I'm thinking maybe we should adjust that policy at the same time and then bring the, the whole package together uh, at a later date. But first, we have an opportunity to discuss if anyone has comments on, on you know, what they are thinking here. Um, Jonathan. I, I can go first <laughs> with mine. Um, they, are, they are extremely different. Um, <laughs> so the way I did mine and the, my thought process was you know, you need a job description for the liaison, but then that job description references things that they need to do that then need to be described as well. You can't just say, develop a legislative agenda and then let them randomly do that however they decide to. So I went and looked at other boards and they all had a policy for this. Like a policy governed their legislative activity and all that. So that was what my thinking was in writing this, was essentially this would be either one policy or three policies or something like that, or sub-portions. And um, so it describes, first one is participation legislation, which just says that the board has the, you know, wants to participate in legislation and promote the interests of the district, and that, that we will do a legislative agenda. And then there's a piece for what the liaison will do uh, to fulfill that, and then the other piece is the timeline for how the legislative agenda works. And then this is meshed together, you know, my original ideas plus best practices from other colleges that I, you know, went, read their minutes, read their agendas, read their policies, saw how a couple, the main two that I looked at were De Anza, Foothill, and LA. Uh, they had really good programs. Um, so that's basically it. I do have one artifact in here where it says Chancellor's direction instead of Superintendent President, but that's because I copy pasted that sentence. Um, but oh, he's getting a promotion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's that's basically it on this one. If anyone has any questions, I've kind of discussed the the development of the legislative agenda, like the timeline. I've discussed that at a couple board meetings before. Um, it's a little diff. I did. This is where I departed from other schools because I thought that this would be a better timeline than what they have. Um, in terms of being on the same, you know, calendar with the legislative, you know, the legislature in Congress. So we can still change these months and when things need to be done by, but in general, this seems to me to look pretty good. But. Marianne? Um, as I was reading these, it occurred to me uh, that it is a different role than a trustee. Any of these three are. Um, it will require a different amount of time and also probably uh, if we decide this is wish, what we wish, a budget. That is a travel or training or whatever. Um, so it is a bigger, uh, obviously, um, I like it because I'd love to have a K-12 liaison part, but uh, I think we really need to look at it in a broader context because it is shifting um, the structure of the board. You know, we went from committee to not committee, and now it's shifting in a different direction, which we really have not, uh, I don't want to say not thought through, because certainly Jonathan has kept us abreast of what he was doing and so forth, but we haven't thought of it structurally. And, and I feel like we need to. Now, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not necessarily being concrete about 
how to do the follow-up for that, but it does change the trustee structure. One of the things that, that I was wanting to have clear here is that we're not changing the structure that says the board acts as a whole. So if we want to support some legislation, suggest a particular approach to K-12, I'm, I'm not sure, it's not as easy to see what it would mean for K-12, right. but I think it does have meaning that the person who is now the expert in these areas comes and informs the rest of the board, and then the board as a whole says, I like it, I don't like it, whatever, before that person moves on to say, okay, this is what my board thinks. Mm -hmm. So that we have that acting as a whole piece, which I think we have to. Um, I think we would risk running afoul of accreditation and other expectations if we didn't operate that way. Uh, and I think it makes good sense because th that's the function is to, to bring in that additional information to the board and then let it decide how to use it. I think that makes sense for K-12 too yeah. because as we're talking about uh, developing further relationships <coughs> and uh, different or uh, reviewing uh, the expectations for what students will be prepared to do when they come to the community college. All of those things in the long run will be big in the sense that the legislative work is large. And um, the liaisons at this point, Veronica and I would claim some expertise in K-12 education, but that's different than speaking for the board. Mm -hmm. It is. And um, the questions that may be implicated in the K-12 area would circle back to the college and input from our governance groups. To. All of that um, could, could be a part of those questions, mm -hmm. as well as what legislation. Mm -hmm. yeah. I will say that, so we are different, in ter if, if we go forward in this way, we'd be really different in terms of having like a legislative liaison instead of a committee, because how every other board has done it is they have a legislative committee that you know work just like our old committees used to work and then that committee would recommend things up to the board so that would be like where we're a little different and maybe it's a challenge to figure out how that works in the long term and in the structure of the board but the traditional way to do what I wrote out here for legislative is you know just having a committee like any other committee like facilities or f uh, fiscal and then that committee would you know, have its work and send it up to the board. But I don't think we should do that necessarily. I think this is fine, but yeah, it is, uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty different than what we've done before. Mm -hmm. What would you see as the downside to going the committee route? I mean, the downside is just that you'd have staff time to set up the committees and I could see the committee not being that active, but you can structure the meetings to be, you know, only once every other month or something like that. So that could be solved. Um, the committee route, I mean, it does work. That's what everyone else does, and they seem to like it. I haven't spoken to anybody, but that's the that's what every single like most other governments too. Like the county has a legislative committee, um, so they would the committee would let more people be involved in this and not, you know, I think. I think the committee's benefit is that if you don't have some like one person on the board who like really wants to do this, then the committee helps break up the work and you know keep it consistent. Like keep this happening whether or not you have like you know you could end up in the previous system with a bunch of trustees who didn't know much about facilities, but you'd still have a facilities committee where like people could engage in that even if they didn't necessarily sign up to because it was just a committee you had to fill. So if we just if we had a legislative committee that existed and you had to fill, then no matter who's on the board, you'd be sure to have people on there. But then that increased staff costs and requirements. Well, what I hear is an objection, a possible objection, is that um, unlike other activity, this becomes increasingly dependent on one person as opposed to engaging the rest of us. The other concern I had was that. Um, uh, is there is there redundancy here? Is uh, 
is the CCLC actually doing the same thing? Um, I know for a fact that, um, that they are because I served on that committee mm -hmm. uh, at the state level. Mm -hmm. And um, they do take, I mean, whether, I suppose we could say, well, maybe they're not doing it well. Um, But that would, that's a judgment call on our part. And the question for us is, uh, how, how do we want to spend our time? Is, is this a legitimate, useful, helpful way to, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I buy the idea that we need to be aware. Awareness is one thing. Putting an effort beyond that to lobby strikes me as possibly something that is already being done on our behalf and perhaps um, not as useful. Maybe uh, one of those things that's just gonna consume our, our time. I, I was gonna say, I think I have some of those concerns and I think that the level of commitment to legislation in particular probably varies with the composition of the board. Yeah. I mean, Jonathan, you have a passion for this and you have stepped forward to do a lot of work on it. But I don't know of anyone in the past who had that passion, and I'm not confident there will be people in the future who have right. that level of interest. And so the fact is CCLC, we paid to belong, and they do do that work um, for us. So we have to think about what is effective. I, I think we're a small piece of a much larger lobbying piece and I'm not, I'm not thinking that as a practical matter we're all that important in that system. It, it might be useful though to uh, have our, our liaison be in contact with the CCLC committee mm -hmm. that is charged with uh, making recommendations to the larger board um, and you know, from my only experience, I, I felt good about working with that committee. They, yeah, yeah. they had some people, and of course people changed, but they had some people who really understood what legislation was all about, how it's made, and who to contact. They, they, knew, the, they knew the players, and uh, so I agree with Marsha. I mean, we, you do. You have a, a lot of not only passion, but awareness about uh, these things. And, at one point in my youth, I did too. Um, but I, you know, I've kind of lost track of those guys. And they, two-year terms in the state assembly, four-year terms in the state senate. I, I lose track of who's who. It's uh, it's relevant who's who, <laughs> Greg. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I read this stuff, but I didn't really get to it until yesterday early, and I. And I went, and quite frankly, at first I was confused, and I went back to it. And then I realized what, like, where it came from. And um, I found what, what Jonathan put forth here um, intriguing. And then how my mind works is I want to go, I want to know, what did we do in the past to address this? And what, we, what I recall in the last four years, I've, or better, I've been around here, is that we, we really relied on the president to relate that information to us and recommend that we go to the conferences and that we be that we educate ourselves and keep up on it. And I think we all did to different degrees. I don't think all of us did it to the same degree. Um, and then I thought about the committees that we used to have and I sat on two of them. And um, as did a lot of us. And I thought about all the stuff that uh, we did and and I thought about the dog and pony shows, and I asked, why are we doing this? And, it's, and the answer was, in those cases, well, it's the way we've always done it. And, you know, they repaved a parking lot, and, they had, and it went 10% over on the cost, so they bring the contractor in to explain why it went over like we're supposed to. And I'm going, why are we doing this? And what's an effective use of my time? So I, I also can see, uh, areas where when we don't have those committees where we meet here more frequently on campus there's less opportunity to ask questions about things or to be face-to-face -face or to 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 uh, 
you know, just to casually voice concerns or to discuss things. Um, so there's a little bit less of that. Uh, this, I, I, try, I was trying to think, why do we need this legislative committee? And I thought about, you know, the past and what we could do. And I think, for me anyway, I think the main thing is, is that at least I know if, if one of my colleagues, colleagues is keeping track of it, and making sure that, and checking to make sure that it's that things have been disseminated and brought to our attention, then I think that's wonderful, regardless of which one of us it might be. So, um, but, and, and sometimes our viewpoints as outsiders and not knowing what all the inside of that state committee is and what's going on, you know. Sometimes we might bring, we might by chance bring a fresh perspective or ask just the right question that, that stimulates things. But I, I'm not that comfortable with the way this is. I, I think I understand it and I, you know, it's, it's a lot of work and then what, and, and I was thinking exactly what you were thinking, why, what Marcia just said a minute ago was about why, you know, who would want to do this? Um, Probably not that hard to find somebody to do it that can work with the president and you know read what the state does and then try to relay it to the board. What else could we do with that and of what purpose it would serve? I don't know. But those people that get on those state boards and the ones we just voted for, I mean, where do they come from? Because they come from places because they got involved in this kind of thing. Okay, and they got interested enough to take an active role. And for that, I commend you, Jonathan. And, um, you know, just because we set up something now doesn't mean it has to stay that way for in perpetuity. But if we have somebody that wants to do that, and who knows what we might, what kind of benefit might, might come out of it, and we're not spending budget money for it, so, um, unless we get too carried away. If we're going to have budget money, I think we should start holding our meetings every six months, maybe go to Disneyland or something. <laughs> but we don't have the funds for that. So um, I'm, um, I'm inclined to try anything. And um, I'm amazed that you did this. And I would like to have a conversation with you about the hows and whys, you were, what you were thinking of, not on the basic things or anything like that, just your motivation. I, I think it's. Uh, I think it's probably a good thing, but I want time to think about it a little bit more. I think, oh, Marianne. I'm sorry I got verbose there. Okay. The, the rock on which we founded, Veronica and I, is the idea of for whom do we speak? If we are the education liaisons, what could we say that we would be sure represented what the board believed or wanted? And how could we not easily trip over Anthony, who is everywhere and knows the principals and the superintendents? And so when you start thinking about that, you ask, what function would we be serving that isn't already served. Anthony clearly can invite any superintendent to come talk with us, or any principal, or any head teacher, or whomever, if we are struggling with something where we all need to hear it. And if we don't all need to hear it, then we shouldn't have a liaison. So I don't, I, and I think, um, uh, the legislative one is a little bit different because um, that is, it occurs away from here and uh, does require more prep and so forth. On the other hand, and, and you can all jump on me if I'm completely wrong about this. I don't want anybody speaking for us on legislative issues unless we've all discussed it concretely first. 
and certainly that's true of education. So I, I don't know how I feel about this. Well, I was going to say one theme I think I'm hearing from people that um, does not implicate this question of what does the board think on an issue is the preliminary part about getting information. Yes. If we have individuals on this board who are passionate about a subject that they can help bring to us more information than we might otherwise learn, and we're not tripping over Anthony in doing that, if, I'm, I'm putting right. all these ifs in here, and we're also not adding, there's another piece of this is that we don't want to pile on on his workload too much here. <laughs> He's got a pretty big brief already. <laughs> um, <laughs> So if we can accomplish the informational component, I don't think we're causing problems among ourselves about what do we think. We are learning. And then the next step is, are there going to be things that come up in that learning that maybe we do have an opinion on and we want to express it? And so we could take that step on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and obviously with Anthony's recommendation. Yeah, you know, I think this is a great discussion, and one of the things that, if I hark back to the original intent of the legislative liaison, it really was more information gathering, just exactly what you're saying, President Croninger, in terms of that. Um, and so now I think it's somehow morphed into something a little bit bigger than that. Uh, we're talking about budget, we're talking about structure, you know, committees and such, but I still believe if we go back to the original intent of the legislative liaison, where Jonathan, since he's interested in this and, and has been kind of the lead on it, if he would gather the information, work with me, we could then make sure that you're aware of whatever legislation is, is happening. And then as you say, Marcia, if there's something that looks like you want to put together a resolution on in support of or whatever, then on a case-by-case -case basis, you can move forward that way. The, K, the, the K-12 is a little bit different because it, it is something that we're all already working on very intimately in the community. So it could be more likely that we could get kind of messed up in, in terms of our mission and what we're trying to, to accomplish. So maybe that doesn't need to exist as much and it could be more ad hoc, if you will. Would it be useful as a resource for you when there are events or uh, topics in K-12 where we're interacting and you have basically go-to trustees who are going to be the experts mm -hmm. and, and that you would they would go with you when you wanted them wanted someone to go. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah, that would be fantastic. That's good. I, I don't I don't want to be misconstrued on um, my, my concerns as expressed earlier because I really feel like a liaison a legislative liaison could be very, very helpful to us. I think uh, I, I would feel uncomfortable if we didn't have a liaison who would say, who'd be able to bring us information about pending legislation, about where it's going, about the impact on, uh, on us. And I, I think that's really contained in the second bullet of, uh, of uh, Jonathan's presentation. And, and I, I think that, that basically sums it up. The other points are how, they're about how you would go about getting the information that you would share with us. And some of them are, are more costly than others, of course. But uh, the basic information I found when I was doing that sort of thing was readily available because the, the state legislature publishes everything online. And, and, uh, and, and the committee to which I refer at the CCLC is eager, you know, that you get a call from anybody out in the, in the hustings and you're eager to respond. And so I think the flow of information is not difficult to gather and I think it could be very valuable. I think we should be apprised of changes, significant changes at the legislative level that are likely to have an impact on our fundamental mission. And then once in a while, I think we should take action by way of a resolution, but very rarely. I, I think it, it could be overdone uh, and lessen uh, its, its significance by so doing. 
But once in a while, I would agree that we should, and on recommendation of the legislative liaison, I, I, would, I would tend to, to move in that direction. And, and the president. Yeah. Well, I, I think Craig referred to the, the fact that in the past we've more or less relied on our superintendent president to do this. So I guess what I'm also getting the feeling is that if we can be helpful in this regard, mm -hmm. if we can have a legislative liaison who, who helps gather and provide that information along with the president, then we are learning and perhaps we are, instead of adding to his workload, helping his workload. I, I would mm -hmm. hope that it would operate that way. Yeah, no, I would be equally concerned yeah. that we're adding to his workload or staff's workload. Staff. This, this, is, uh, this is work being done elsewhere and I think we can tap into it. Yeah, I agree. Craig? Yeah, since uh, Anthony's got, gotten here, um, We've been looking at changes, and now we're seeing them more and more come about. And uh, nobody's always really comfortable with change unless it's their idea. And that's kind of like human nature. But uh, I see the board here evolving, <coughs> and um, you know, not just being kept busy, but evolving and really focusing on why we're here. And um, the only point I wanted to add to this was, so kudos for all of that, this whole board is like really gets, just keeps getting better. Um, there's one point on the agenda every time and at some point in there, I'm not looking at it right now on the screen, but it, sometimes there's a category like at the end of meeting, items for future discussion and whatever. Yeah, that's the second meeting a month, but yes. Yeah, the only one meeting a month, but um, I think that should be on every meeting because we have these, like, if, we're, if someone here is interested in K-12 or they have questions that they want to discuss a topic on that, we should be able to add that at the meetings. Um, I shouldn't have, as a board member, I shouldn't have to call Marsha, and then Marsha can call Dr. Beebe or vice versa. I can just say it at the meeting, it goes in the minutes, we, you know, one of the board members interested in this. I, I think that should be more open. Um, that's just my opinion. It doesn't mean I'm right. No, no, that. Uh, I think it needs to be easier. And it needs to be every meeting, not just one meeting. We can do that. It's no problem. If but that, it, is, nobody it is the practice that we are supposed to, yeah, well, to do that. Yeah, well, the yeah. question is why do we do it that way? And because we've always done it that way. You know, and, and but I, still, there is really good history. There's really good to look at the past and figure out why things were set up the way they were set up. Mm -hmm. I have watched like nonprofit boards, new crop of people get in there and they undo everything. A couple years later, they put it all back the way it was. I've seen it over and over again. So I don't want change for the sake of change. But when we do want to make a change, let's look at why we're doing it. And, and we're not a nonprofit agency in, in this sense like that. But we but we have responsibilities and sometimes we need to concentrate harder in certain areas than in other areas. And so our structure of committees and liaisons needs to be flexible and it needs to be to change with the needs. And that's what I like about what I see going on around here right now. And, and I, this right now, maybe if times were different, we'd be fine with the finance committee. And a couple people that like to read those numbers could go there, you know, once a month and read those numbers and ask questions. But I think now there are times when it, everybody needs to be really involved in that. So this is a perfect time for the whole board to be involved in that budget. A few years ago, it might not have been that critical or the need wasn't that strong. So we can change as we need to. Um, okay, I, I'm sorry, I, I, sometimes, I just like to share sometimes. <laughs> okay. Um, Anthony, do you feel like you've got enough to work with in terms of trying to pull something together for a later meeting that we can talk about? So my understanding is is that we still want to to maintain the the idea of liaisons, be it K twelve or legislative. Um, but but you want you're directing me to kind of re rewrite the the job descriptions a little bit. 
on yeah, each, let's, each of let's, those? Yeah, let's get them in balance for yeah, one we can thing. Do that. Yeah, and we also can do maybe that. integrate them with the process where the board policy on, on uh, you know, I think what we want or what I'm hearing is options, flexibility. When we come to the year and we say, what are we going to be doing this next year? And we talk about it. We can talk about, do we want any subcommittees? Is that appropriate for this coming year? Do we want uh, liaisons and in what areas? And that will probably reflect the particular passions and interests of board members as well as uh, the situation at any given time. Mm -hmm. And and with, I hope, respect for the staff time that, that some of these can consume. So Yeah, let me take uh, a crack at it. I'll bring it back to you and okay. see what we do. I think like when you write this kind of thing, it maybe it has to be written in two steps. And I know you're doing it all in one, mm -hmm. but it's like, what's the goal here? And then the other part of it is, you know, what's the plan to achieve the goal or how am I going to carry it out? You know, or what, it, then maybe, or maybe before you do that even, you have to write, you know, like an order or a directive. But, um, so it's like, it was all done at once. And so different people are going to formulate it in their minds differently. So I wouldn't make a big career out of it, but, you know, um, He's got a keep, career. You know, <laughs> if it's, you know, I, I like the KISS method. Yeah, I agree with you. Okay. Can we move on then, guys? Oh, no, we have to Please talk do. some more. <laughs> Please do. All right. We have two minor changes to existing board policies, which both are related to dates. 7.2, we are revising the evalu date for evaluation of the superintendent president to the end of July instead of June because mm -hmm. there's just too much going on uh, right now, and <laughs> it's a hard time of year to be trying to cram something else in. And... Um, we are revising our board policy on when we make decisions about international students. That date as well, it was something that came up earlier in one of our meetings, so we're catching up to that. So may I have a motion to approve both those changes? Jonathan? Motion to approve both. Second, someone? Second. Peter? Any comments, questions, whatever? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Those two are done. Now we come to board policy on animals on campus. Anthony, do you want to give us a couple of words on that? Yeah, and I have uh, our director of security, Eric Fricke, is here um, if you need more detailed information on this. But in general, we're talking about uh, animals on campus and specifically, um, to be quite uh, upfront about it, for the most part, we're talking about dogs on campus. And, you know, we have always been and are very dog friendly <coughs> at our, our campus here. Uh, that's important to us. And, uh, of course, we bring, bring animals intentionally on campus at certain times of the year to uh, help students become, you know, not as stressed out when it, when it comes to finals week. And, and at other times we do that, the same kind of thing. So very animal friendly, very dog friendly here. But... There are occasions where um, we have people, students and such, that will want to bring animals into a classroom setting. And that can be problematic. You can, you can end up in uh, dog fights uh, you know, in a classroom, in a building. We have other problems that can come up with animals uh, in a building um, that aren't very pleasant. And, uh, so what we're trying to do here is at least give us some kind of a, of a framework uh, to be able to address uh, the, the, the rare incidents. I mean, they don't happen a lot, but when, they, when the incidents do come up, give us some kind of, of policy that we can fall back on uh, related to animals and, and dogs on campus. So that's what this is all about. Man, if we pass this, I won't be able to bring my Pekingese to the board meetings. <laughs> I don't recall seeing your Pekingese at the board meetings. Is that a That's correct. You have not. Is that a certified comfort dog? Let's, uh, let's have a motion to approve, and then we'll discuss. So, Peter, is, is that why you're raising your hand? Mm -hmm. uh, second? Jonathan? Okay. Question. Aren't we on first reading, though? It, it is, oh, you're it right. Is first it reading. is first reading. So, yeah. I'm, I take it all back. I'm sorry. Uh, um, good point, Jonathan. Discussion? Discussion. I think this this seems very reasonable. I think uh, uh, 
Dr. Beebe is quite right. We, we have enjoyed sort of an open campus and have dogs walking through campus. It's a light, large open area. It's kind of a, a pristine park, and I think we'd all like to keep it that way. Um, my only suggestion has to do with a minor word change uh, in the second paragraph where we say the district has the right. That's a statement of fact. Mm. Uh, and therefore not terribly necessary, which I think it would be improved if we said it was the, the district reserves mm. the right to designate certain areas as animal-free zones. That's mm. a future tense statement of intent that may make more sense. No wonder he has a PhD. <laughs> he actually learned something. Good show. Does anyone else have a comment or thought? I do, but... Marty? Yeah, I think um, when I saw the district has the right, I thought you were going to say to ban certain bad dogs. I mean, you'd have to say it some other way. Um, but I, th I think that might be something that we would want to think about because there are certain dogs that really don't like other dogs very much. And, you know, and, then, and I think it's good that the owners are uh, um, tasked with, I don't see where it is now, but it, here it is, to, uh, to rec uh, um, exercise reasonable control over yeah. their animals. I mean, I think that's that's the crux of the good behavior. Uh, but then what do you do if they don't? There's nothing in here that really says so. <laughs> you know, I, I, I do think that some dogs probably shouldn't be here, you know? Mm -hmm. I've been in enough doggy puppy classes and so on, there's always a, a strange thing that goes on sometimes. Yeah, so well-behaved well dogs, non-aggressive dogs, yeah. that's, that's those different are the good dogs. The <laughs> yeah. You know, we're good really dogs. getting into more operational I know. kinds of things here. Yeah. And, and but I didn't I, know if you wanted to reserve the right to. Yeah, what I'm kind of thinking is, is that we could um, make this higher level and more policy level okay. in the way this is written, mm -hmm. and I apologize for that. No, no, it's um, good. And taking out some of these, these more operational kinds of issues that we can deal with in the AP. Yeah. Yeah, I was That's actually right. having the same the same feeling yeah. that that I really think. the first sentence yeah. mostly does it. And then the next step usually in our pro policies is to say that the superintendent president will develop an AP that describes the details because there really are details here that yeah. um, to your I point. Agree. No, yeah, I to agree. Your point. I think that's that and designating certain areas and all that sort of thing can all be in that. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Yeah, I agree with just that first part being mm -hmm. the policy. I could see the last sentence also. Yeah. About the dogs thing. in the building. Oh uh, yeah, like we, we, with the exception service of service right. animals. Because yeah. yeah. that's a facilities issue, we could, that's part of board policy. But mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. besides that, the middle part can go yeah. to AP. To an AP. Yeah. 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 And yeah. probably more. <laughs> yeah. Some of the yeah, I mean, that's really yeah. what you're first saying, Marty, is maybe we should be specific about the dog needs to dog be well behaved yeah. and all that kind of stuff, but that's operational. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing from Eric if he feels this is mm -hmm. going to cover the subject or? Mm -hmm. No, that's right. Yeah, he did come here for a reason. <laughs> he did come here. Yeah. Just sitting He's here. been very yeah, patient. He's, He's been incredibly patient. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Board, uh, President, Dr. Beebe. Uh, we're just uh, examining the BP and so <coughs> the AP has a lot more information regarding the rules, regulations uh, towards uh, animals, uh, requiring them to be on a leash and under the control of the uh, owner at all times. So um, I was more prepared in, in discussing the AP, so if that's going to be a later uh, discussion, then I can wait till then. Well, actually, we don't usually get involved in the AP unless there's something new and exciting coming in that we haven't mm -hmm. right. heard about before or something. Something material. That's yeah, right. something material change. Um, what we're struggling with here is if we provide the broadest level, policy level direction, which looks to be the first sentence and maybe the last sentence, then the rest of it can go in the AP and we're fine mm -hmm. because you guys are figuring out the details. That's the operation. Mm -hmm. That's good. So like, the question is basically, would that work for you? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we can get into the details in the AP, you know, as, yes. as discussed. Yes. Okay. 
And then cool. does that have to go to the academic senate, or where does that go? Well, the AP goes through the normal governance process. Okay. You know, it wouldn't come here, but it'll go know, through CPC. Yeah. CPC, yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Good. Okay. No, that's good. Yeah, the, and, and you can queen here, so. yeah. you can talk to you can talk to um, BPAP about whether or not <coughs> this kind of a change would need a revisit. But I think we're mostly removing operational stuff, not adding any new exciting concepts here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is good. That's good. Right. I mean, owners are required to. I guess that's that would be an operational mm -hmm. yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> not our issue. <laughs> okay, <laughs> on to the next one. Thank you. Okay, and uh, and Marty also pointed out the 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 conundrum of what do you do when people don't follow the rules. So that sounds operational to me too. At yeah, this that's, point, that's unless you need to come back to us, you can, you can do that. <laughs> okay. Um, that this brings is, us this is to the, the end. next. This is the tough one. Mm -hmm. Adjourning. 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 Yeah. I don't know how to do that. Is there something you wanted to add? No. <laughs> I was waiting with bated breath for you to okay. say meeting is adjourned. Meetings adjourned. Commencement tomorrow. <laughs> Commencement tomorrow. V30 at the bookstore or campus. 4:30, uh, isn't it? Well, if you go at four. Just four. so you're already by 4:30. Okay, be yeah. there. Four. Okay. That's why I put it on my be calendar. Be there at four. four. Yes, that makes four. sense. I thought four o'clock. Perfect. Mm. Something going on on campus tomorrow morning, and I thought, man. Oh.